Amen, amen. Jimmy slicing them up. Man, amen. God bless y'all. Thank God for the choir. Thank God for the for the band every Sunday leading us in worship. We appreciate their uh, faithfulness to practicing and, and, and having that thing tight for us. Never want to take them for granted, so God bless them. And while we're on the praise team and, 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 and the band, we talk about artists and all the rest of the crew that went to Mozambique, they're back today. So thank God for them. They got the opportunity to go all the way back home and, and to do ministry. And so uh, looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, all the wonderful things that they accomplished. I uh, want to take this time to uh, encourage everyone to, uh, whenever you give, I don't know if y'all ever see that drop down on the app for Ghana and, and for, for trips to Africa. Please, please, please give something towards those trips. Uh, a lot of great things are going on over there. And so we thank, thank God for Lloyd Chin being part of us and, 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 and encouraging us to go, uh, almost dragging us out there, making us go. And we, we went, and the Lord has done some amazing things. And so uh, our eyes have seen some wonderful things. So we just continue to pray. We've got some, some other trips going next year. So continue to pray for that. Give to that. And um, if the Lord uh, moves you, pack up for that. You go. You go see what's going on. You be a part of that. All right? Everybody doing okay today? You know, all right? I, I figured I'd see a whole bunch of yawning uh, from last night's game since we got done so late. Amen. Amen. You clap for the Astros. It's all right. It's all right. Amen. It's going to uh, it's gonna be even more amazing once Deshaun gets us to the promised land at the end of the football season. If you think, if you think Houston is lit up behind the Astros, let the Texans win a Super Bowl. All you transplants in here, it's going to be hellacious for 365 days because we've been waiting for a football winner. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad for you. So I'm just warning you right now, Deshaun is going to get us there. And all you Cowboy fans, we're just going to be all in your face. All in your face. Amen. We thank God for this opportunity to stand before you. Um, uh, we won't uh, prolong, prolong the thing with a bunch of chit-chat and sports talk, but there's more important things that we want to get accomplished today. And so um, we have been in the Be Perfect series out of the book of James for the last several weeks, and so we want to continue on with that. And today we will be coming out of the, uh, uh, well, of course, the book of James out of chapter 5 in the book of James. So if you would turn with me, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And if you're able to, please stand with me for the reading of the word. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. And it reads as follows, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. And today I want to speak uh, from a topic of uh, imperfect riches, how riches lead, can lead to ruin. If you would, please bow your heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your word. Lord, as we've seen, as we've traveled through James, that uh, you've got some tough things, Lord, to say to us. But all of it is to, uh, Lord, to get us to a better place. All of it is to grow us up. All of it is to make us stronger, to make us wiser to open our eyes, Lord, to, 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 to deliver us from bondage. And so, Lord, we humbly, humbly submit to you right now and simply say, Lord, that we don't know how to please you all the time with our finances. 
And we, Lord, we oftentimes we get caught up in our finances to where we forget about you. Uh, you are our source and our supply. It is with you that we put all of our trust. And so, Lord, uh, help us today. Help us to take these, uh, these words, Lord, and plant them in our heart. And help us to just simply do better. Lord, you got a lot of things you want to do through us. And, Lord, we want to do those things. But far too often, Lord, we find ourselves just kind of caught in the middle, just kind of floating. And so, Lord, uh, help us to uh, be diligent to the things that you've called us to. Lord, uh, we're just so grateful to you for our pastor. We pray for him in his absence. We pray that he's safe, that he speaks well, and that your spirit will speak through him over his shine, and those people might be blessed. And we look forward to when he gets back. Thank you for him and his family. Comfort them, protect them, keep them. All the, the, the children, his wife, we love them so. And so we lift them up to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen. Amen. Imperfect riches. How riches can lead to ruin. We have a, uh, a fish tank in our living room at home. And if I were to be honest with you, uh, that is a partially regrettable purchase. Um, the way it came to our living room is all my fault, and I take full blame. I had a friend at my job who had a fish tank, and he had one of those big, nice ones, 220-gallon one. And it had all of these colorful fish. He showed me the picture, and, man, the picture was something else. And I was like, man, I want... I want one of those in my house because we've got an empty place in the back of the living room. It would fit perfect. And so we, uh, we bought one. We didn't go 220, but we got a 100-gallon. A That's pretty big. And so we got it, and we got all the fish, man, and it looks all nice and cool and all of that. But um, no one told me, and I didn't do enough research about the maintenance and the cost to keep up that thing. Um, when we first got it. My buddy hooked me up with his guy, and we had a guy come out uh, once a month, and he would come clean that thing. And, man, after about a couple of months, I was like, man, this dude costs me more than my yard guy, and I think the yard guy works harder than he does. <laughs> and so I cut him, and I decided to do it myself. <laughs> and so no one told me all the stuff you had to buy, all the chemicals, all the equipment. All the food, you got to clean the, the filter. You got to change the water every week. You got to take off like the top of the water. And it, it, it got to a place where it was just like, man, this is too much. And man, when the other guy cleaned it, it was cool and, and the fish were swimming and everything. But after I cleaned it, there would be a casualties. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we still have the tank. It's not looking its best. And uh, the, the fish that are in there are not the fish that started with us. <laughs> but here we are. We, we got something because we had an empty space in the back. And it looked good. But we didn't count up the cost to fill this empty space. And now we got death. And I bring up the fish tank because James is dealing with that kind of situation here in Chapter 5. You got some folks that are empty on the inside and decide to fill up that emptiness with their riches. But don't understand that that doesn't fill up the emptiness on the inside, and there's a cost to what you're doing with your riches and, putting, and, 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 and using those riches to fill a void in our lives. Um, as believers, when we read chapter 5 of James, verses 1 through 6, we might have a tendency to kind of look at it and say, man, that's, that's not us, you know, that's... You know, those are rich folks. We, why would James write that to us? Well, I, we're on this journey to becoming perfect, and, 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 and the Lord's growing us up, and perfect is to reach the end or complete a process to be complete in all parts, full grown, lacking nothing, comes from going through the necessary stages to reach the end goal. And so um, I think James puts this in there, speaking directly to some unbelieving rich folks, but I think he has that in there for us 
so that we would get a, a warning and a lesson on if we don't handle our finances correctly and if we allow money to become a focus of our hearts that we might find ourselves running into trouble ourselves. I think he puts that in there to warn us not to allow our riches to lead us into ruin. And so as we take a look at these rich folks that he talks about in one through six, I'm seeing four things that uh, James is telling us. And the first one I'm seeing is this in verse uh, one. Our riches become our ruin when the content of our character is based on our worldly possessions. Our riches become our ruin when the content of our character is based on our worldly possessions. He says in verse 1, come now, you rich. And he directly addresses them as rich. He doesn't say, come on, brothers. But he says, come now, you rich. These people are defining themselves. Their life worth is defined by their riches. And James starts this way in order to grab their attention. He says, come now to lead them out of their current situation and hopefully to, to cause them to change. James' rebuke is aimed at the ungodly rich because they are drunk on the wine of wealth. See, whenever you're drunk, your vision is blurred and your judgment's compromised. And all of that is because you're under the influence of something. And these rich people are under the influence of their riches. Now, money, riches is not a sin in and of itself. You need money to make exchange for goods. You got to have money to buy stuff and, and do things. But when your heart is consumed by riches... That's when we are doomed. Whenever money becomes a treasure to us, that's when the money becomes our master and we become a slave to it. So whenever you become a slave to something, you're controlled by something or other than the Lord Jesus. And that's when it becomes a problem to us. So believers aren't prohibited from pursuing careers and doing things to, to increase your, your salary and things like that. But what cost is that direction that you're taking in your career? What's your motivation behind what you're doing at your job and in your career? Whenever I started working and fresh out of college, there was always like an older worker who would tell you, hey, whenever they come with something, don't say no. I don't know if y'all ever heard anybody say that to you. Don't, if, if your boss come to you with an opportunity, don't say no. Whatever they come with, especially minority workers, if they come to you, that means they thought about you. And if they thought about you and they're offering that, that means you better take it. Because if you don't take it, they ain't coming back. And so they always tell you, don't say no. If you got a, if you got a job that's going to move to Philadelphia, don't say no. If they're going to move you uh, overseas, don't say no. Don't say no. But there's a problem if you're constantly not saying no and saying yes to everything. That means you're saying no possibly to some stuff that's more important than that career. While you're saying yes to every promotion and saying yes to every assignment, are you then saying no to your, chil to your children? If you're saying yes to every promotion and yes to every assignment, are you then saying no to your ministry? So there's a cost whenever we put finances, money, and career, and those things first in our lives that we didn't uh, think about before we did that. And here's the kicker about trying to accumulate wealth. Our valuables don't make us valuable. <laughs> our valuables don't make us valuable. So if your valuables don't add value to you personally, why is it that we envy those with money? Why is it that we envy those who have more than us? I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, I'll look at somebody with more than me and I'll have some envy in my heart. And some of the things that we, I, I kind of think of whenever you envy someone else with more is, man, it seems like those with more always have good connections. The people that have more than you always got a, a, a hookup somewhere, always got to connect somewhere. But here it is, as a Christian, you've got the greatest connection of all times. You've got a connection to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so you've got that kind of connection going on. And the rich always seem like they got everything. 
They got all the resources. They got all the access. But yet again, here and still, we got the connection to the one that created everything, and we got a connection to the one that owns the cattle on, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so if we have that connection to all those resources, why would we ever envy those with money? And then lastly, what we envy oftentimes, or what I envy about the, uh, those that have more than me, is that it always seems like those with money live a life of ease. It always seems like things are, are, are well with them, right? You see them on vacation always, and, and, and you see them in nice cars always, and they, they, they have the best of everything. At least that's what it seems like. But God doesn't promise us a, a, a life of ease, but we've got something far greater than ease. We've got perfect peace through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us. So whenever anything goes on in our lives, any troubles that go on, we still got peace on the inside of us. So the unbelieving rich find their identity in their savings where the, the mature believer understands that the pleasure of wealth only veils the eternal sorrow that awaits them. All of us envy the wealthy, but none would exchange for their punishment that James talks about in verse 1. He says, weep and wail for your miseries that are coming upon you. And so this isn't new to the Jews. Uh, they've heard this stuff even back to the days of their forefathers. Back in, if you read Deuteronomy 28, and God talks about all the blessings that he's going to give them as they go into the promised land. But he says, don't forget about me and don't, 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 don't disobey me. Because if you do, then those blessings turn into to curses. So James is warning the reader of the judgment that is to come in the future. And so the same thing happens to these believers here in Jerusalem that after James writes this book, Jerusalem is overtaken by King Nero. So if our valuables will have no value to us in the judgment, our valuables will have no value when it comes to judgment. Our valuables are kind of like a, a, a poor diet. When you think about food, all of the stuff that tastes the best is always the worst for you, right? Everything with all the salt, everything with all the sugar, everything with all the fat, that's always the best tasting stuff. But as you eat all of that stuff, you're damaging your body. And in the same way, that's how our, our uh, uh, chasing after finances, our, our uh, lust with money is doing the same thing, is that it's damaging us. Even though we're enjoying it now, there is uh, something that we have to pay for in, uh, afterwards. Our problem is we've worshipped the tools, but we haven't worshipped the trade. We worship the tools, but we don't worship the trade. What do I mean by that? I mean, before Christ, we had empty lives. Everything that we did was dead. Everything that we did was, was, was just death. None of it was any gain with God. But when God reached out to us and opened, us, opened our eyes to salvation, he gave us good works that we can do and accomplish for him. And so everything that we have access to, all of the stuff that he gives us, we're supposed to use that stuff to glorify him. But our problem is, is we've turned the stuff that he gives us access to and we begin to praise that stuff instead of praising the very one who gave us the stuff in order to glorify him and bring glory to his name. So we've worshiped the tools and not the trade, uh, um, worship the tools and not the trade. And so the first thing we see is uh, our riches become our ruin when the content of our character is based on our worldly possessions. But our riches become our ruin whenever we fail to utilize our possessions for gospel impact. The unbelieving rich keep score of the wealth that they possess. In verse, uh, in verse 2 and 3, it talks about riches, it talks about clothing, and it talks about gold and silver. Whenever somebody wanted to show off their wealth, they would, talk, they would show off their gold and silver. They would wear jewelry around, show you their big gold jewelry. And then also, they would have these nice fine clothes that they would wear. People in those days were, were poor, but the rich would show off how rich they are by the, the kind of clothes that they would wear. The poor would only have the clothes on their back. 
But the rich had enough that they would, they would change. They would have different uh, uh, outfits that they would wear. They would have stuff in their closets. So the poor only had enough for the day, but the rich had enough to, to, to have in their closets. And then it says their riches, meaning their grain, their stored up grain that they had. Stored up grain isn't a problem. That's just like us and how we save money and put it into a bank account, how we save money and put it into our retirement. But the problem with the stored up grain is this. You've got far more than enough for a rainy day. You've got way more than enough. But you sh you're showing that, writ that grain off instead of allowing someone who's hurting and needs it to have that grain. So that's, our, that's the problem. Our, uh, accumulation, our accumulation of wealth is strictly a paper chase. It's, it's, it's our race to ball out, our race to show somebody how much we have. And here's the deal. The hoarding of wealth is our personal statement in how we feel about God. Our hoarding of wealth is our personal statement in how we feel about God. If I wanted to know how much you love God personally, all I would have to do was ask you for your credit card statement. If I wanted to know how much you love God personally, all I would have to do is ask you for your bank statement because that would show me where your spending is. That would show me where you're putting all your money. That would show me what's priority in your life. And so whenever we hoard our wealth and whenever we hold on to stuff and we can't let that thing go, we're telling God that we don't trust him. Because when we don't want to let it go, that means we don't trust that our hand is going to be refilled. We don't trust that wherever we got it from, that it's going to be refilled and not just refilled, but filled with even more than we have in the first place. So we show that we don't trust God. But then also this, God tells us that if somebody asks you for the, co for the coat, that you're supposed to give it to them, right? And so when somebody asks you a genuine need and you don't supply that need because either you're judging them or you just simply want to hold on to your stuff, you're not only telling God you don't trust them, you're telling them you don't fear them. And that's, and, 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 that's, and that's trouble for all of us. We're opening ourselves up to some wrath, of, to the wrath of God whenever we don't obey his word. So the way we handle our finances, it gives our personal statement in how we feel about God. So the unbelieving rich, they keep score with their possessions, but the mature believer understands that there's potential in our possessions. In, the, in verses 2 and 3, it says that the rich is rot. So those grains, uh, James is telling them that those things will rot. And he says, your clothes are moth-eaten. And he says, your gold and your silver is rusted. And it will be a witness against you because you've hoarded in the last days. James rebukes the unbelieving rich for wasting opportunities to share their wealth. Now, if something's moth-eaten, if something's rusted, and if something rots, what does that simply mean? That simply means you haven't used it. Now, if I was to go in some of y'all's refrigerators, and I'll include mine too, and go to that vegetable drawer, there'd be a... A chemistry set in there, a, a, a petri dish of, of all sorts of all sorts of things because you you had every intentions to use that 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 celery that you bought, but after a, a, about a three or four days you forgot all about it, and now it's in that vegetable drawer, uh, uh, just hiding and, and, and stinking up everything. And so whenever you don't use something, that's when it, 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 that's when it, it, it rots and it rusts. And James is rebuking these folks because they're not using what God has given them to glorify him. And, and this rebuke isn't just talking about future judgment, that they're going to get theirs in the by and by. But it also means there could be some trouble in their lives for not using what God has given them. See, riches aren't guaranteed in our lives. We may have something now. We may be at a, a certain level now, but that doesn't guarantee we'll be at that certain level tomorrow. As we hoard our riches, who's to say that we won't get sick? And, and, and nobody can plan for a sickness well enough because we don't know how long we could be sick. We don't know what could happen unless the Lord intervenes and heals us. We don't know how long that thing could be. And so, man, we... We don't know what can happen to us. So whenever we put 
finances and, 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 and gaining money in the front, that doesn't mean that that thing is guaranteed. And our troubles will come from our own actions. We won't have anybody else to blame. That would be all on us. The verse says that our stuff is witnessing. Our hoarding of our finances is witnessing against us. That simply means this. In the, in, co in the courtroom, we've become our own star witness against us. That our actions with our funds, that God is looking at all of that stuff, and he uses all of that evidence that we supply to, to judge us. So what we have in our pockets now, we got to look, look at it in a totally different way. We got to look at what we have in our wallets, what we have in our purses. We got to look at it in a totally different way. What we have in our purses and our pockets is potential. What we have in our purses and our pockets are potential to score points with God. Uh, we got potential to gain rewards with God. So what are we going to do with that thing if the panhandler asks for it? Maybe you don't give to the panhandler. You say, okay, no, 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 that's against the law. But what about that family member of yours? You know that they're in trouble, and they need something, and you got it, but you won't give it. God is watching us when we don't do that sort of thing. So our riches become our ruin when we fail to use our possessions for gospel impact. And then thirdly, our riches, we'll get that right, our riches become our ruin when we selfishly use our resources for personal indulgences. The unbelieving rich use their riches to fulfill their sinful desires. In verse 5, it says that they live luxuriously and that they led a life of, of wanton pleasure. James rebukes the unbelieving rich for using their riches for self-satisfaction. It says they live luxurious, luxuriously and they led a life of wanton pleasure. If you want to understand what that means, all you have to do is remember the story of the prodigal son. Remember how he lived before he lost all of his money. He was partying and everybody was cool with him. And, and if you go forward in the story and, and, and hear the brother's rebuke of him, he says that he wasted his money on prostitution. Every desire that the prodigal son had in his body, he indulged it. Any itch that he had in his body, he scratched that thing. And that's what the verse is telling us that these people are doing in James chapter 5, is that they are, are, are living luxuriously. But when you go back to verse 4, it makes it even worse. It says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath so what does that mean these folks are able to live luxuriously because they won't pay the workers who are working their fields so the word for luxurious it means to live soft and they can have a soft living because somebody else is doing all of the hard work they're able to live extravagant on somebody else's back. It, whenever we indulge our flesh, whenever we live by our desires, that's an addictive form of lifestyle. Because anytime we try to appease the flesh, the flesh is insatiable. Anytime you have a desire and try to feed those des desires in your heart, you're going to always have to come back and constantly keep feeding that desire and keep feeding that desire, keep feeding that desire because the flesh is in insatiable. And this sort of living disregards God and his commands because we give no priority to the kingdom. But that's not us because the mature believer understands the destruction that lies ahead for, for selfish living. It says in verse 5, you fatten your hearts in the day of slaughter. James warns the unbelieving rich of the doom that awaits them for their living. The unbelieving rich in this verse, based on what James is telling us, is like that if you've ever been to the rodeo and gone to the livestock show, that rodeo cow that they do that big auction for, What's happened is, is, you know, you have those kids in FFA or whatever, and, and they got that cow, and man, for a year or however, they fed that cow the best corn, they fed that cow, whatever cows eat, they gave them the best of what they were supposed to eat, and now that cow is good and fat, and they have that auction, and folks going crazy, and somebody wins, and then ultimately, that cow ends up on your plate at Papa's Steakhouse. 
And so that cow has been prepared for the slaughter. What James is telling us, as we indulge our flesh and use our money to indulge flesh, we are preparing ourselves for the slaughter. We're preparing ourselves for our punishment. Parents, I know, I, I know a lot of you uh, uh, spank in the house, and we spank ourselves. What James is telling us is this. Uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of spanking. Like, I don't look at that like, man, I just want to whoop some kids today. <laughs> but there's always that one, there's always that one time where you're like, yeah, this is going to be good. <laughs> and that normally happens when you've told the child not to do something. And they continue to do it. And you've told the child not to do something, and somehow you went away, and so now they're having fun doing the very thing that you told them not to do. And so now you appear and see what they're doing, but they don't see you. And now you got time to get your hand right where it's supposed to be. I don't know how you hold your thumb, but you get your, you get your hand perfect, because you don't have time to go get your, your, your weapon of choice or whatever. But... You come up behind them and you say, I told you. And you give them that best one. That's exactly how God is looking at us while we use our finances to indulge our flesh. That each and every indulgence just raise out behind higher and higher to get to that perfect spot where the Lord can spank us for what we're doing. We're preparing ourselves for the slaughter. Everything that we do. It's just working us towards a greater punishment. We don't give priority to the kingdom. So every indulgence is simply an increase in a punishment that awaits us. And so this lastly, the last point, our riches become our ruin when we personally gain from the suffering of others. Now, this is the one where I was like, man, a lot of people might not uh, really relate to this one and really Man, it's more relatable on the other side, meaning being the one that's oppressed. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the insecurities of the unbelieving rich manifests itself in the oppression of the poor. In verses 4 and 6, you see that they're withholding wages in verse 4. And then in verse 6, it says the rich people have condemned and put to death the righteous man, meaning they are cheating people in court. They are, are, are using bribery and things like that to cheat people out of their money. Basically, rich folks are insecure, and they're using whatever thing that they have to keep other folks from being what they are because of their insecurities. And so you see that in some of our, uh, 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 some of our processes in, in, in our country. How you do, when you talk about school taxes and funding for school, how, how a school is uh, uh, funded by the taxes of the neighborhood. So that's immediate classism right there because if you live in a poor neighborhood, then you're going to have a poorly funded school. And therefore, the kids at the poorly funded school will stay in their poor neighborhood because they haven't been educated as good as someone that may be in a rich school getting good funding, meaning they have good teachers and they have a good education. So you see that sort of thing in our our systems, voter rights laws, we, we haven't seen one real voting fraud case, but every year they seem to change the voting rights rules and, 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 and moving things around. And you see it in our school loans. You see it in that kind of stuff where the funding for schools has gone down, but the price hasn't. And so therefore you see student loans skyrocketing. All of these different things, you feel the effects of oppressive, oppressive but here's the great thing, and here's what, 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 what believers can find solace in in verse 5 or verse 6. Excuse me, verse 4. Verse 4, he says, The outcries of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears or the, of the Lord of Sabbath or the Lord of hosts, meaning those who are being oppressed. Those who are feeling the pressures of someone in power over them, they can have hope knowing that the Lord hears their prayers, that the Lord understands what they're going through. He sees what they're going through. James lets the unbelieving rich know that the Lord sees and hears the cries of his people. This verse brings comfort to the believer. God knows. But sometimes we feel like we don't know when he's going to answer. But... 
I believe through his word, a lot of times he's answered already. Some of the times we're waiting for an answer, but the answer is right here in his word. Um, as we talk about some of the, uh, uh, the effects of, of oppressive measures, man, we are, uh, we're in financial peace right now. And, and like that first, the first three weeks, they do this thing called a snapshot. So everybody that's in the class, you turn in a card and you're supposed to put in all your debts, non-house debt on the card. And so everybody turns one in, each family, uh, if, each individual, if you're single. And so we had 13 submittals of cards, 13, representing 13 families or individuals. I got those back and did the calculation. We had 990,000 in debt. 13 submissions, 900, almost a million dollars of debt amongst all those folks. And you know what it is. This is non-house debt. And everybody in the room can, knows exactly what's going on with all that debt. It's not credit cards. It, it's, it's not the cars. Some of it is the cars, but what is it? It's the student loans. So each and every one of us learned growing up, man, if you want to do something for your family, if you want to make some money, you got to go to school. But they, when they cut the funding for it, it take, it's like pulling a rug out, out from under somebody, and now they got to get, get a loan. And so now they are in all of this debt. But where's the hope? The hope is in the word of God if you just stick with it. All those people in that class, when they look, when they look at those cards, everybody was shaking their head. Everybody was down. Everybody was, was just toe up like, man, this is, this is the worst. But there's hope for every one of them. Why? Because if you just simply adhere to what the word of God says, it may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen next week. But as, the, as a year goes by, as two years go by, as three years go by, you can pay off some of those debts simply by adhering to what the word of God says. So as we pray about certain things that we feel is wrong in the world, the word of God gives us steps to take. Even when there's oppressive measures, the word of God gives us wisdom where we can navigate. Even when the enemy tries to get us, God allows us an escape in different areas that we can navigate when, when, when the enemy is coming upon us like that. So God hears us, God sees us going on, and God is listening to our prayers. And so lastly, I just wanted to end with this real quick as we talk about our uh, finances and what, what to do with the finances. It's just one, one simple question. Is it a miracle or is it a mirage? Is it a miracle or is it a mirage? When I talk, we talk about mirage, what is a mirage? It, it, it's, it's a it's a visual thing that isn't real. So in the desert, the sun shines off the sand in a certain way to where it looks like water. And so you'll run to that area and then find out it was nothing but sand to begin with. Some of the things that we chase after look good in the beginning. But as we run after it, we find out it had nothing to offer us, no value to add. It's a mirage. But also is the thing that we're looking at a miracle. Whenever we have people that have a need, people in our lives that, that, that need something from us, that looks terrible from the beginning. Because if I give this person what I got, that means I'm not going to have what I give to them. But will that benefit somebody else? And then lastly, will God then adhere to his word and supply for you what you gave to somebody else? So is it a miracle or is it a mirage? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Um, you have done so well by us, Lord. Um, you supply for us each and every day. Uh, none of us in the room, Lord, can say that you left us destitute. Lord, even when we thought that we didn't have something, Lord, somehow, some way, you came through on time. And so, Lord, um, you just asking us to always keep your first. Always keep our focus on you. Always to obey your statutes. 